BC. Generally considered the most important king in the history of Sparta, Agesilaus was the main actor during the period of Spartan hegemony that followed the Peloponnesian War. Although brave in combat, Agesilaus lacked the diplomatic skills to preserve Sparta's position, especially against the rising power of Thebes, which reduced Sparta to a secondary power after its victory at Lectra in 371 BC, despite the traditional secrecy fostered by the Spartiates. The reign of Agesilaus is particularly well known thanks to the works of his friend Xenophon, who wrote a large history of Greece covering the years 411 to 362 BC, therefore extensively dealing with Agesilaus' rule. Xenophon furthermore composed a panegyric biography of his friend, perhaps to clean his memory from the criticisms voiced against him. Another historical tradition, much more hostile to Agesilaus than Xenophon's writings, has been preserved in the Hellenica Oxyrhynchia, and later continued by Diodorus of Sicily. Moreover, Plutarch wrote a biography of Agesilaus in his Parallel Lives, which contains many elements deliberately omitted by Xenophon. Agesilaus' father was King Archidamos II, who belonged to the Euripontid dynasty, one of the two royal families of Sparta. Archidamos already had a son from a first marriage with Lampedo named Augis. After the death of Lampedo, Archidamos remarried in the early 440s with Eupolia, daughter of Melissippides, whose name indicates an aristocratic status. Agesilaus was probably born a few years later, in 445 or more likely in 444. Agesilaus also had a sister named Kyniska. The name Agesilaus was rare and harks back to Agesilaus I, one of the earliest kings of Sparta. Agesilaus was born lame, a fact that should have cost him his life, since in Sparta deformed babies were thrown into a chasm. As he was not heir apparent, he might have received some leniency from the tribal elders who examined male infants, or perhaps the first effects of the demographic decline of Sparta were already felt at the time. And only the most severely impaired babies were killed. At the age of seven, Agesilaus had to go through the rigorous education system of Sparta, called the agoge. Despite his disability, he brilliantly completed the training, which massively enhanced his prestige, especially after he became king. Indeed, as heirs apparent were exempted of the agoge, very few Spartan kings had gone through the same training as the citizens, another notable exception was Leonidas, the embodiment of the hero king. Between 433 and 428, Agesilaus also became the younger lover of Lysander, an aristocrat from the circle of Archidamos, whose family had some influence in Libya. Little is known of Agesilaus' adult life before his reign, principally because Xenophon, his friend and main biographer, only wrote about his reign. Due to his special status, Agesilaus likely became a member of the Crypta, an elite corps of young Spartans going undercover in Spartan territory to kill some helots deemed dangerous. Once he turned 20 and became a full citizen, Agesilaus was elected to a common mess, presumably that of his elder half-brother Augis II, who had become king in 427, of which Lysander was perhaps a member. Agesilaus probably served during the Peloponnesian War against Athens, likely at the Battle of Mantinea in 418. Agesilaus married Cleora at some point between 408 and 400. Despite the influence she apparently had on her husband, she is mostly unknown. Her father was Aristomenides, an influential noble with connections in Thebes. Thanks to three treaties signed with Persia in 412-411, Sparta received funding from the Persians, which it used to build a fleet that ultimately defeated Athens. This fleet was essentially led by Lysander, whose success gave him an enormous influence in the Greek cities of Asia as well as in Sparta, where he even schemed to become king. In 403 the two kings, Augis and Pausanias, acted together to relieve him from his command. Augis II died while returning from Delphi between 400 and 398. After his funeral, Agesilaus contested the claim of Leotychidas, the son of Augis II, using the widespread belief in Sparta that Leotychidas was an illegitimate son of Alcibiades, a famous Athenian statesman and nephew of Pericles, who had gone into exile in Sparta during the Peloponnesian War, and then seduced the queen. The rumors were strengthened by the fact that even Augis only recognized Leotychidas as his son on his deathbed. Diopetes, a supporter of Leotychidas, however quoted an old oracle telling that a Spartan king could not be lame, thus refuting Agesilaus' claim, but Lysander cunningly returned the objection by saying that the oracle had to be understood figuratively. The lameness warned against by the oracle would therefore refer to the doubt on Leotychidas' paternity, and this reasoning won the argument. 
The role of Lysander in the accession of Agesilaus has been debated among historians, principally because Plutarch makes him the main instigator of the plot, while Xenophon downplays Lysander's influence. Lysander doubtless supported Agesilaus' accession because he hoped that the new king would in return help him to regain the importance that he lost in 403. The conspiracy of Synodon took place during the first year of Agesilaus' reign, in the summer of 399. Synodon was a hypomane, a Spartan who had lost his citizen status, presumably because he could not afford the price of the collective mess, one of the main reasons for the dwindling number of Spartan citizens in the classical era, called oliganthropia. It is probable that the vast influx of wealth coming to the city after its victory against Athens in 404 triggered inflation in Sparta, which impoverished many citizens with a fixed income, like Synodon, and caused their downgrade. Therefore, the purpose of the plot was likely to restore the status of these disfranchised citizens. However, the plot was uncovered and Synodon and its leaders executed, probably with the active participation of Agesilaus, but no further action was taken to solve the social crisis at the origin of the conspiracy. The failure of Agesilaus to acknowledge the critical problem suffered by Sparta at the time has been criticized by modern historians. According to the treaty signed in 412 and 411 between Sparta and the Persian Empire, the latter became the overlord of the Greek city-states of Asia Minor. In 401, these cities and Sparta supported the bid of Cyrus the Younger against his elder brother, the new emperor Artaxerxes II, who nevertheless defeated Cyrus at Cunaxa. As a result, Sparta remained at war with Artaxerxes, and supported the Greek cities of Asia, which fought against Tissaphernes, the satrap of Lydia and Caria. In 397 Lysander engineered a large expedition in Asia headed by Agesilaus, likely to recover the influence he had over the Asian cities at the end of the Peloponnesian War. In order to win the approval of the Spartan assembly, Lysander built an army with only 30 Spartan citizens, so the risk would be limited. The bulk of the army consisted of 2,000 Neodamodes and 6,000 Greek allies. In addition, Agesilaus obtained the support of the oracles of Zeus at Olympia and Apollo at Delphi. The sacrifice at Alice Lysander and Agesilaus had intended the expedition to be a Panhellenic enterprise, but Athens, Corinth, and especially Thebes, refused to participate. In spring 396, Agesilaus came to Aulis to sacrifice on the place where Agamemnon had done so just before his departure to Troy at the head of the Greek army in the Iliad, thus giving a grandiose aspect to the expedition. However he did not inform the Boeotians and brought his own seer to perform the sacrifice, instead of the local one. Learning this, the Boeotians prevented him from sacrificing and further humiliated him by casting away the victim, they perhaps intended to provoke a confrontation, as the relations between Sparta and Thebes had become execrable. Agesilaus then left to Asia, but Thebes remained hateful to him for the rest of his life. Meeting between Spartan King Agesilaus and Parnabas II in 395 BC, when Agesilaus agreed to remove himself from Hellespontine Phrygia. Campaign in Asia Once Agesilaus landed in Ephesus, the Spartan main base, he concluded a three months truce with Tissaphernes, likely to settle the affairs among the Greek allies. He integrated some of the Greek mercenaries formerly hired by Cyrus the Younger and his army. They had returned from Persia under the leadership of Xenophon, who also remained in Agesilaus' staff. In Ephesus, Agesilaus' authority was nevertheless overshadowed by Lysander, who was reacquainted with many of his supporters, men he had placed in control of the Greek cities at the end of the Peloponnesian War. Angered by his local aura, Agesilaus humiliated Lysander several times to force him to leave the army, despite his former relationship and Lysander's role in his accession to the throne. Plutarch adds that after Agesilaus' emancipation from him, Lysander returned to his undercover scheme to make the monarchy elective. After Lysander's departure, Agesilaus raided Phrygia, the satrapy of Parnabazus, until his advance guard was defeated not far from Daskalion by the superior Persian cavalry. He then wintered at Ephesus, where he trained a cavalry force, perhaps on the advice of Xenophon, who had commanded the cavalry of the 10,000. In 395, the Spartan king managed to trick Tissaphernes into thinking that he would attack Caria, in the south of Asia Minor, forcing the satrap to hold a defense line on the Meander River. Instead, Agesilaus moved north to the important city of Sardis. Tissaphernes hastened to meet the king there, but his cavalry sent in advance was defeated by Agesilaus' army. After his victory at the Battle of Sardis, 
Agesilaus became the first king to be given the command of both land and sea. He delegated the naval command to his brother-in-law Pisander, whom he appointed Navarch despite his inexperience. Perhaps Agesilaus wanted to avoid the rise of a new Lysander, who owed his prominence to his time as Navarch. After his defeat, Tissaphernes was executed and replaced as satrap by Tithrost, who gave Agesilaus thirty talents to move north to the satrapy of Parnabazus. Augustilaeus' Phrygian campaign of 394 was fruitless, as he lacked the siege equipment required to take the fortresses of Leontin Caefali, Gordian, and Mile II Ticos. Tens of thousands of derricks, the main currency in Persia, were used to bribe the Greek states to start a war against Sparta, so that Agesilaeus would have to be recalled from Asia. Xenophon tells that Agesilaeus then wanted to campaign further east in Asia and sow discontent among the subjects of the Achaemenid Empire, or even to conquer Asia. Plutarch went further and wrote that Agesilaus had prepared an expedition to the heart of Persia, up to her capital of Susa, thus making him a forerunner of Alexander the Great. It is very unlikely that Agesilaus really had such a grand campaign in mind, regardless, he was soon forced to return to Europe in 394. Although Thebes and Corinth had been allies of Sparta throughout the Peloponnesian War, they were dissatisfied by the settlement of the war in 404, with Sparta as leader of the Greek world. Sparta's imperialist expansion in the Aegean greatly upset its former allies, notably by establishing friendly regimes and garrisons in smaller cities. Through large gifts, Tithrusts also encouraged Sparta's former allies to start a war in order to force the recall of Agesilaus from Asia, even though the influence of Persian gold has been exaggerated. The initiative came from Thebes, which provoked a war between their ally Ozoli and Locris and Phocis in order to bring Sparta to the latter's defense. Lysander and the other king Pausanias entered Boeotia, which enabled the Thebans to bring Athens in the war. Lysander then besieged Haliartus without waiting for Pausanias and was killed in a Boeotian counterattack. In Sparta, Pausanias was condemned to death by Lysander's friends and went into exile. After its success at Haliartus, Thebes was able to build a coalition against Sparta, with notably Argos and Corinth, where a war council was established, and securing the defection of most of the cities of northern and central Greece. Unable to wage war on two fronts and with the loss of Lysander and Pausanias, Sparta had no choice but to recall Agesilaus from Asia. The Asian Greeks fighting for him said they wanted to continue serving with him, while Agesilaus promised he would return to Asia as soon as he could. Map of the situation in the Aegean in 394 BC, with the long return of Agesilaus from Asia. Agesilaus returned to Greece by land, crossing the Hellespont and from there along the coast of the Aegean Sea. In Thessaly he won a cavalry battle near Narthaceum against the Pharsalians who had made an alliance with Thebes. He then entered Boeotia by the Thermopylae, where he received reinforcements from Sparta. Meanwhile, Aristodamos, the region of the young Aegead king Agisipolis, won a large victory at Nemea near Argos, which was offset by the disaster of the Spartan navy at Nidus against the Persian fleet led by Conan, an exiled Athenian general. Agesilaus lied to his men about the outcome of the Battle of Nidus to avoid demoralizing them as they were about to fight a large engagement against the combined armies of Thebes, Athens, Argos, and Corinth. The following Battle of Coronea was a classic clash between two lines of hoplites. The anti-Spartan allies were rapidly defeated, but the Thebans managed to retreat in good order, despite Agesilaus' activity on the front line, which caused him several injuries. The next day the Thebans requested a truce to recover their dead, therefore conceding defeat, although they had not been bested on the battlefield. Agesilaus appears to have tried to win an honorable victory, by risking his life and being merciful with some Thebans who had sought shelter in the nearby temple of Athena Atonia. He then moved to Delphi, where he offered one-tenth of the booty he had amassed since his landing at Ephesus, and returned to Sparta. No pitched battle took place in Greece in 393. Perhaps Agesilaus was still recovering from his wounds, or he was deprived of command because of the opposition of Lysander's and Pausanias' friends, who were disappointed by his lack of decisive victory and his appointment of Pisander as Navarch before the disaster of Nidus. The loss of the Spartan fleet besides allowed Conan to capture the island of Kythera, in the south of the Peloponnese, from where he could raid Spartan territory. In 392, Sparta sent Antalcidas to Asia in order to negotiate a general peace with Tiresias, the satrap of Lydia, while Sparta would recognize Persia's sovereignty over the Asian Greek cities. However, the Greek allies also sent emissaries to Sardis to refuse Antalcidas' plan, 
and Artaxerxes likewise rejected it. A second peace conference in Sparta failed the following year because of Athens. A personal enemy of Antalicitas, Agesilaus likely disapproved these talks, which show that his influence at home had waned. Plutarch says that he befriended the young Aegean king Agisipolis, possibly to prevent his opponents from coalescing behind him. By 391 Agesilaus had apparently recovered his influence as he was appointed at the head of the army, while his half-brother Teleusius became Navarch. The target was Argos, which had absorbed Corinth into a political union the previous year. In 390 BC he made several successful expeditions into Corinthian territory, capturing Lechium and Piraeus. The loss, however, of a battalion, destroyed by Iphicrates, neutralized these successes, and Agesilaus returned to Sparta. In 389 BC he conducted a campaign in Acarnania, but two years later the peace of Antalcides, warmly supported by Agesilaus, put an end to the war. Maintaining Spartan hegemony over Greece and returning the Greek cities of Asia Minor to the Achaemenid Empire. In this interval, Agesilaus declined command over Sparta's aggression on Mantinea, and justified Phoebus' seizure of the Theban Cadmia so long as the outcome provided glory to Sparta. Agesilaus expels the Illyrians from Epirus in 385 BC when war broke out afresh with Thebes, Agesilaus twice invaded Boeotia. Although he spent the next five years largely out of action due to an unspecified but apparently grave illness. In the Congress of 371 an altercation is recorded between him and the Theban general Epaminondas, and due to his influence, Thebes was peremptorily excluded from the peace. And orders given for Agesilaus's royal colleague Cleombrotus to march against Thebes in 371. Cleombrotus was defeated and killed at the Battle of Lectra and the Spartan supremacy overthrown. In 370 Agesilaus was engaged in an embassy to Mantinea, and reassured the Spartans with an invasion of Arcadia. He preserved an unwalled Sparta against the revolts and conspiracies of Helots, Piraeici and even other Spartans, and against external enemies, with four different armies led by Epaminondas penetrating Laconia that same year. Asia Minor Expedition in 366 BC, Sparta and Athens, dissatisfied with the Persian king's support of Thebes following the embassy of Philiscus of Abydus, decided to provide careful military support to the opponents of the Achaemenid king. Athens and Sparta provided support for the revolting satraps in the revolt of the satraps, in particular Araya Barzans, Sparta sent a force to Araya Barzans under an aging Agesilaus. While Athens sent a force under Timotheus, which was however diverted when it became obvious that Araya Barzans had entered frontal conflict with the Achaemenid king. An Athenian mercenary force under Shabrias was also sent to the Egyptian pharaoh Tachus, who was also fighting against the Achaemenid king. According to Xenophon, Agesilaus, in order to gain money for prosecuting the war, supported the satrap Ariabarzans of Phrygia in his revolt against Artaxerxes II in 364. Again, in 362, Epaminondas almost succeeded in seizing the city of Sparta with a rapid and unexpected march. The Battle of Mantinea, in which Agesilaus took no part, was followed by a general peace. Sparta, however, stood aloof, hoping even yet to recover her supremacy. Egypt expedition Ajazilas, with Athenian general Shabrias, in the service of Egyptian king Nectaniba I, Egypt 361 BCE. In 361. Agesilaus went to Egypt at the head of a mercenary force to aid the king Nectaniba I and his regent Teos against Persia. He soon transferred his services to Teos's cousin and rival Nectanebo II, who, in return for his help, gave him a sum of over 200 talents. On his way home Agesilaus died in Cyrenaica, around the age of 84, after a reign of some 41 years. His body was embalmed in wax, and buried at Sparta. He was succeeded by his son Archidamus III. Agesilaus was of small stature and an unimpressive appearance, and was lame from birth. These facts were used as an argument against his succession, an oracle having warned Sparta against a lame reign. Most ancient writers considered him a highly successful leader in guerrilla warfare. Alert and quick, yet cautious, a man, moreover, whose personal bravery was rarely questioned in his own time. Of his courage, temperance, and hardiness, many instances are cited, and to these were added the less Spartan qualities of kindliness and tenderness as a father and a friend. As examples, there is the story of his riding a stick horse with his children and upon being discovered by a friend desiring that. He not mentioned till he himself were the father of children 
and because of the affection of his son Archidamus for Cleonymus. He saved Asphodrius, Cleonymus' father, from execution for his incursion into the Piraeus, and dishonorable retreat, in 378. Modern writers tend to be slightly more critical of Agesilaus' reputation and achievements, reckoning him an excellent soldier, but one who had a poor understanding of sea power and siegecraft. As a statesman he won himself both enthusiastic adherents and bitter enemies. Agesilaus was most successful in the opening and closing periods of his reign, commencing but then surrendering a glorious career in Asia, and in extreme age, maintaining his prostrate country. Other writers acknowledge his extremely high popularity at home, but suggest his occasionally rigid and arguably irrational political loyalties and convictions contributed greatly to Spartan decline. Notably his unremitting hatred of Thebes, which led to Sparta's humiliation at the Battle of Lectra and thus the end of Spartan hegemony. Historian J. B. Berry remarks that there is something melancholy about his career, born into a Sparta that was the unquestioned continental power of Hellas. The Sparta which mourned him 84 years later had suffered a series of military defeats which would have been unthinkable to his forebears. Had seen its population severely decline, and had run so short of money that its soldiers were increasingly sent on campaigns fought more for money than for defense or glory. Xenophon's Agesilaus other historical accounts paint Agesilaus as a prototype for the ideal leader. His awareness, thoughtfulness, and wisdom were all traits to be emulated diplomatically, while his bravery and shrewdness in battle epitomized the heroic Greek commander. These historians point towards the unstable oligarchies established by Lysander in the former Athenian Empire and the failures of Spartan leaders for the eventual suppression of Spartan power. The ancient historian Xenophon was a huge admirer and served under Agesilaus during the campaigns into Asia Minor. Plutarch includes among Agesilaus 78 essays and speeches comprising the apothemata Agesilaus' letter to the ephors on his recall, we have reduced most of Asia, driven back the barbarians, made arms abundant in Ionia. But since you bid me, according to the decree, come home, I shall follow my letter, may perhaps be even before it. For my command is not mine, but my country's and her allies and a commander then commands truly according to right when he sees his own commander in the laws and ephors, or others holding office in the state. And when asked whether Agesilaus wanted a memorial erected in his honour, if I have done any noble action, that is a sufficient memorial, if I have done nothing noble, all the statues in the world will not preserve my memory. Agesilaus lived in the most frugal style alike at home and in the field, and though his campaigns were undertaken largely to secure booty, he was content to enrich the state and his friends and to return as poor as he had set forth. When someone was praising an orator for his ability to magnify small points, Agesilaus said, In my opinion it's not a good cobbler who fits large shoes on small feet. Another time Agesilaus watched a mouse being pulled from its hole by a small boy. When the mouse turned around, bit the hand of its captor and escaped, he pointed this out to those present and said, When the tiniest creature defends itself, like this against aggressors, what ought men to do, do you reckon? Certainly when somebody asked what gain the laws of Lycurgus had brought Sparta. Agesilaus answered, contempt for pleasures. Asked once how far Sparta's boundaries stretched, Agesilaus brandished his spear and said, as far. As this can reach. On noticing a house in Asia roofed with square beams, Agesilaus asked the owner whether timber grew square in that area. When told no, it grew round, he said, what then? If it were square, would you make it round? Invited to hear an actor who could perfectly imitate the nightingale, Agesilaus declined, saying he had heard the nightingale itself. Thanks for watching.